Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Matt A02, The Magic of Numbers. Uh, in today's class, we're going to be talking about clock arithmetic. So one of the things that we've been doing through most of the first, say, half of this class is just reconstructing a lot of the um, numbers that we've all learned in school, right? So like we invented addition and multiplication and division, but you guys have already all seen that before. So it's not really that new, even though we're trying to get start from first principles. Today, we're going to think about what math might have been if we had invented it somewhere else. So we're actually gonna invent, invent numbers that you guys probably aren't actually already familiar with, or at least you may not think you're already familiar with them. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's remind ourselves, what do mathematicians do? And we talked about this a bit last week. So, well, we invent new ways of counting and measuring things and things like addition, multiplication, exponentiation, and uh, all that fun stuff. We figured out how to reverse them. So if you want to add, maybe you want to subtract, things of that sort, uh, we division roots. But of course, in order to do that, we also had to deal with um, inventing new types of numbers to allow us to reverse them. So maybe we invented the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, to just count upwards. But then in order to count backwards, then you need negative numbers. Maybe if you want to count parts of things, then you need fractions. And then if you want things like square roots, uh, et cetera, then you might need irrational numbers. And of course, in, uh, on Wednesday's lecture, we talked a tiny bit about complex numbers. So these imaginary numbers people made up because they turn out to be useful for certain kinds of problems, but they're really sort of off of the normal number line. <clears throat> but there's some sense in which these are all extensions of the counting numbers. So you might have, uh, let's start with natural numbers. So natural numbers. Those are things like zero, one, two, three, so on. And so that's one group of numbers here. And then, uh, well, we also have the integers. So that's including negative numbers, which are inside of the natural numbers. So you have integers, oh, sorry, uh, natural numbers are inside of the integers. So integers like minus five, minus three, minus one, uh, minus 100, et cetera. And you notice that the integers includes the natural numbers. So every time we're creating new, we created a new number and then we said, well, this new number type can be added and subtracted and incorporated with our old number type. So we had uh, natural numbers then we have integers. And then when we uh, added fractions, well, then you, you get the rational numbers. So the rationals, so those are like uh, two thirds minus one half, five sevenths, things like that. Okay, and of course we kept on going. So then we also had the irrational numbers, which together with the rationals, um, well, uh, those are the real numbers. Uh, let's say I have black. So you have the real numbers, which includes really fun numbers like pi, like e, like the square root of two and so on. And so we, we kept on going, right? And of course, then we got to complex numbers. So these imaginary numbers, these square roots of minus one, which are also super weird, but somehow you can add those to your ordinary numbers. And so even though we have all these weird numbers, you, you can um, still, they still fit into the same framework. Uh, oh, I'm out of colors, aren't I? Oh no, I still have orange. Okay, great. So then you have complex numbers, which looks something like i two plus ei, uh, pi plus i times the square root of two, things like that. But now every time we invent a new kind of number, we really want them to fit with our existing numbers. And so somehow, even though we were inventing all these new numbers, we weren't, we were really just extending what we already knew. We weren't really inventing something brand new. But is there something, uh, what color should I use? Let's use red. Is there something out here that's completely separate from the natural numbers? So if you were to reinvent math from scratch, could you come up with something completely different or maybe not completely different, but that, that has some similarities, but that doesn't actually work with the existing numbers we have. And that is the topic of today's class as well as uh, the next several lectures. So we're going to be inventing a new kind of way of counting. Or I mean, it's not really, really going to be counting as we know it. These are the non-counting numbers. So there are a number of different ways to think about what numbers are, right? So. One way to think about numbers is that there's some abstraction for counting objects, right? 
So I have one pen. If I had two pens, then I would be one, two. You could add them together, you could multiply them, and you'd have 100 pens. But, and in this paradigm, operations like addition and multiplication are secondary consequences of better counting, right? So addition is just a faster way of counting really big numbers. Multiplication is just a faster way of adding lots and lots of numbers, and so on. And so we sort of we kept on, on that progression, but really they were all just more complicated ways of counting things. So your first trap question, what other ways are there of thinking about math? So in this sort of paradigm, the numbers were the basic thing. And then we also, we, the sort of operations just sort of floated out of them. Is there anything else you could do? So in some sense, uh, like the hint is to think about reversing the above. So we have numbers that uh, subtract, find the patterns and the algorithms and find ways to make them faster. Um, so let me really point out what I was just saying. Like somehow the number is really important thing. And then we were talking about the operations as sort of like things that came out of it, right? But we're trying to get rid of our ordinary numbers, right? So what else can we keep that would allow us uh, operations to find numbers? Yes, exactly. And we already sort of had some of those, right? So it's because we invented division that we had to invent fractions. But maybe you can do this at the very, very beginning, like not even start with ordinary counting numbers and just be like, well, what if I just have then the number we, uh, yes, yeah, no, I've been trying to get, uh, give you guys a sense of like what it is to invent numbers. Um, and some of you asked, well, it seems like all the good numbers have already been invented. And well, that, that's kind of true. Like mathematicians have been working at this for literally thousands of years. But somehow, if you just think about the operations, maybe you can invent numbers that fit those operations, even if they don't quite match with the numbers we all know and love already, or maybe not love, but at least know. And so another way to think about math is as an abstract game, right? Where you have operations like addition and multiplication, and the numbers don't mean anything or mean something completely different. So for some of you, that might be how you already think about mathematics. It's some game, you push symbols around, you have some symbols and then you, you combine two numbers and suddenly you get another symbol. And so there is some sense in which for the first half of class, I've been trying to say, no, 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 no. It's not just some abstract game. It actually has some meaning when you think about it in terms of counting. But it is just as true that you can also think about math as this abstract game of just pushing symbols around and um, everything means something completely different. Or is uh, in fact completely meaningless. Like uh, you might argue that, well, simply because you have the rules of a game doesn't mean that there's any meaning assigned to it. And that is completely true. But well, um, people play video games all the time and those don't necessarily have meaning other than what we assign to them. And the same is true in some ways of mathematics. Uh, so let's assume that I gave you some weird operation and you wanted it to look like math. So like, obviously you could define an operation however you wanted to. You could say that sky plus grass equals blue. And that seems a bit odd, but you, you could say that. But the question is, would that make for an interesting math? And maybe it would, but maybe it wouldn't. So like, what are the types of properties? So what do we want to happen when we add things together? Or what do we want to happen when we multiply things together? And remember, when we were studying addition and multiplication, we proved a number of properties of addition and multiplication that came out of just the fact that they were advanced counting. So what are, what are types of properties that you might want in an abstract addition and multiplication? Uh, the amount to grow, grow significantly. Okay, so that's one thing you could do. So like maybe you want things to still be like counting because in some sense, things getting bigger and bigger is sort of like counting over and over again. But here we're trying to invent things that are different from counting. So what were some of the other properties that we cared about uh, with respect to addition and multiplication? What are the other rules that we gave you? Like you've been learning in school for however many years that, um, that you've been learning in school for however many years that maybe you just had memorized and we proved in this class, but maybe that's another starting point. Gives you natural numbers, multiply big numbers. I'll give you a hint. At some point in school, you guys had to memorize a bunch of properties. They all had names, right? So like 
what are the properties of addition? Like you guys had to memorize a bunch of properties. They all had weird big names. Um, anyone? We also covered them in this class. So uh, back in lecture one uh, B, I want to say. So when we were inventing addition and multiplication, ah, yes, great, great. So the distributive property is one of them. And we had several others. What were some of the other, the commutative property? Yep. Uh, I think there's uh, associated property. Okay, great. Yeah. And then we also had, uh, yep, commutative associative identity and distributive property. So somehow those were, uh, actually those are on the next page. Oh, actually maybe they're not on the next page. Uh, well, anyway, we'll get to those in a little bit. Where, what page will I put those on? I think those might be several pages in. Oh yeah, there's several pages in. But so we have these properties and in some sense you could think of them as just some weird arbitrary rule for pushing around symbols. And now the question is, if you had something else that satisfied those rules, would that create a mathematics? And the answer I'm going to argue today is yes. So let's consider a completely arbitrary system. So we don't have any idea what numbers are. What's zero? What's one? What's two? What's three? Um, instead, I'm going to give you a number system with four numbers, numbers in quotes, um, triangle, square, star, and circle. Okay? So these are completely arbitrary. These could be apple, banana, orange, and pear if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter. I'm just creating something completely arbitrary. Well, what else did we say we needed? We needed some set of numbers, and then we need some set of operations on them, right? So, well, um, maybe let's start with just addition and multiplication since that makes life a little bit easier. Since there are also, you can define powers based off of multiplication, right? Um, in fact, you, um, so let's say that we had this table. So this is the multiplication, oh, sorry, this is the addition table, right? So when you add uh, two numbers together, you look at uh, what row and what column, and that tells you what they add up to. Uh, so for example, I might have something like, uh, what color am I using, right? Red, okay. So maybe I want to say that triangle plus triangle, well, what's triangle plus triangle equal to? Well, that's there, that's there. And so that's equal to, uh, it's still equal to triangle. Uh, maybe square plus square. Well, what's that equal to? Uh, square, square, so that's equal to triangle. And maybe star plus square is equal to, well, what's that equal to? Oh, well, star plus square is equal to circle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so we have this. I've given you an addition table. Um, whether or not it's a good addition table, we don't really know. I'm just like throwing it at you and being like, hey, here's this game I want you to play. Whenever you see a triangle and a triangle together and you add those, those give you a triangle, okay? So some weird arbitrary game. And if you remember back all the way back to elementary school, the primary school, maybe this is how you thought about addition and especially maybe multiplication. Oh, wait, what just happened? Did I just erase it? Oh, I had my eraser on. Let me put that back. Square plus square is equal to triangle. Star plus square is equal to circle. And turn it off. And so some, that might have been how some of you thought about multiplication tables, right? So you had this big table of like zero through nine, and or sorry, one through 10 and one through 10. And then there are some like matching between the two. And yes, maybe if you took the time and repeatedly added, you could have come up with a multiplication table. But for many students, well, you just sort of sit there and you're like, well, if I memorize this 100 by 100 like table, sorry, but this 10 by 10 table with all 100 slots, and I can do well on the exams. Um, well, even though that's not what math really is about, the sort of memorizing of tables, what if that is what math were about? And that's basically the, what we're exploring today. So, uh, well, if you have a multiplication table, well, you can multiply stuff together. Let me do this in different colors. So maybe triangle, uh, sorry. I, I'm, my triangles are sometimes tilted. Um, they're all triangles. Uh, triangle times square is equal to, oh, uh, well, what is that equal to? Triangle times square, that's equal to triangle. Uh, what about um, star times circle? Well, star times circle, that's equal to square. And uh, lastly, well, let's say circle times circle, well, that's equal to star. Oh, this is the most I've understood math in a while. I love some good shapes. 
Yeah, but so like there's some sense in which you could one way to approach math is to think of it as a game uh, with these rules that you have to memorize. And then once you've memorized them, you can play and move things around. Um, so let's have you all do a few of these. Uh, so let's see, solve each of the following. So I should I have to give you the tables. And um, what is uh, star plus square? Does that have a value? Okay, so it looks like people are starting to reply. So well, we have star plus square. So that would be equal to circle, right? So that is indeed B. Uh, what about, oh, ah. What about this uh, equation here? And let me zero out the chat. What about triangle plus square first and then add a circle to it? What does that equal? Well, I mean, we have parentheses, so that means that's what we do first, right? So notice that when we're doing ordinary addition, you don't have to worry about the parentheses because we already showed the associated property that it doesn't matter what order you add things in. Well, we haven't done that for this uh, number system yet. And so you can't assume that that's true. But so, well, let's see. So what's uh, triangle plus square? Triangle plus square is a uh, square and then still plus circle and square plus circle is a star, which is indeed C. Okay, uh, so, so far so good. What about uh, star times star times circle? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I should have drank water before starting. Okay, so let's see what this is equal to. Well, this is still star times, well, what's star times circle? Star times circle is a square and star times square is a star. Okay. And uh, lastly, let's do circle times star plus circle. Uh, and let me zero that out. Okay, it looks like you guys are getting the hang of this. So, well, that's equal to circle times, well, what's star plus circle? Star plus circle is here and here. So that's a square. And then circle times square. So circle times square gives you circle, which is indeed D. Okay, let me erase this. Okay, and like, so this is one way of understanding additional multiplication. And uh, if you want to do it really, really fast, well, this is something that you were forced to memorize back in primary school for the ordinary numbers, right? And so here I've given you this arbitrary table, um, but we still need to check whether or not this arbitrary table has the, the same kinds of properties that we care about for our ordinary numbers, right? So like I just mentioned one of them, the associative property, which you guys also mentioned, like does add, if you add in a different order, does that make a difference? Is it true that it, does the distributive property hold? If you multiply first, is that the same as multiplying against both of the things and then adding? Well, we don't know, but we have the entire table. So like this number system only has four numbers. And so you can actually just brute force check every single one of the properties you care about because there well, are only four numbers. Um, and we're not gonna do that, but uh, it might be good for you to play with that a little bit in your own time, but we'll do a couple of them. So the commutative property. So the commutative property basically says that X plus Y is equal to Y plus X or X times Y is equal to Y times X. And this is actually pretty easy to see because you can just look in the table and see that um, it's symmetric, right? So the upper left and the lower right, sorry, upper right and the lower left are the same thing. Um, so this is just the, the symmetry of the tables, of the tables. And so this is indeed true, but you can sort of see this, right? So triangle plus square is equal to square, which is also happens to be equal to square plus triangle. And uh, the same is also true for multiplication. So things like circle times star is equal to square, which is also equal to star times circle. And you can check this one by one for every one of your um, things and then you're done. And so in some ways, proving stuff about this is a little bit easier than proving stuff about 
all the numbers, right? Because like when we were doing proofs about all the numbers, well, you had to go through and use logic to figure out that these properties actually help. But in the case of just a small finite set of four numbers, well, you could just brute force check every single pair. Um, we also have the associative property and we're not gonna check all of them, but you can see a couple of these. So notice that triangle plus square plus star, if you do it in list order, that's equal to square plus star, which is equal to circle. And if you do it in the other order, triangle plus square plus star, do it in the other order, that gives you triangle plus circle, which is equal to circle. So that is indeed true. And you can also do the same kind of checks for, uh, for all the multiplications. So somehow I've given you an additional multiplication table that, uh, that already satisfy these properties. The identity property is a little bit weirder, right? Because I was basically saying that zero plus anything was equal to uh, itself. And, or one times anything was equal to that, that, that thing. Now, when you're staring at this, well, we don't have zero and one, but do you have something where uh, one of these symbols where if you add uh, it to anything, you get that thing back? Which symbol is it? Yeah, it's the triangle. So um, notice that uh, the triangle, this line, you add it to stuff and you get the same thing over again. Oh, wrong button. So triangle plus anything is equal to whatever that question mark was. Um, so what about multiplication? Do you have some symbol where if you multiply by it, uh, you, you get whatever you originally started with back? All right, yeah, so people are answering squares and that's correct. Notice that the list column and list column other are the same because when you multiply by a square, you get the same thing back. So square times anything is equal to whatever you started with. And lastly, I'm not gonna check this because it's gonna take, well, more time than I really wanna spend on it. But we also have the distributive property, which you can check by hand. So you just have to take my word for it that the list set of tables does actually satisfy the um, distributive property. Or we actually, no, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, we're going to move on today, but if you don't want to take my word for it, you can just check manually that this is actually the um, right, correct multiplication tables to match the distributive property with addition. Okay, and so we've now done this weird sort of game, right? So I've been like, well, I have this operation. I'm going to call it addition. Why we call it addition will become a little bit obvious maybe uh, on Wednesday. And we have this other operation which we're going to call multiplication. And uh, it turns out that somehow, even though I've given you these four symbols, these and the, these weird property uh, operations, they still satisfy all the major properties of. Uh, they still satisfy all the major properties that we care about for the, um, the uh, for the numbers. Any questions about that all that before I move on? So I've spent the last however many weeks telling you that it's not all just a game, but then I'm like, well, you can also treat it as just a game if you want to. And that's something mathematicians do. Okay, great. So now that I've convinced you guys that it's all a game as well, um, well, let's try to invent something a little bit more practical than this weird four number set, right? So this four number set doesn't really seem like it does anything, right? Like what is it useful for? But let's go back and uh, I think this is the point at which I'm going to do a live demonstration now. So let me move this over and actually, let me stop sharing the screen for a bit. Uh, oh, sorry, enable. And let's stop the share for a bit. And I'm just going to lecture. Uh, so this is one of the things that we can do now that we're in person is I can give demonstrations. Uh, wait, why is that not showing? Uh, stop, okay. 
Um, ah, there. Great. Okay. Hopefully, you guys on Zoom can still hear me. If you can't, uh, well, send a text message and hopefully someone will shout at me. But yeah, so why did we figure out how to do counting in the first place? Well, one reason that we think people figured out uh, or mapped in the first place was the count things, right? So let's start counting things. So if I, let's see, okay, so I'm still visible on the screen here. Okay, so if I start taking steps in this direction, one, two, three, four, we can count those steps, right? So how many steps am I from where I starting point? Let's, let's mark with not there. So I'm now four steps away from my starting point, right? So I can walk back one, two, three, four. And somehow that's correct, right? So somehow we can walk in the direction, we can count backward, we can count forward. And how do we know how many steps it'll take for me to walk back? Well, if I walk four steps, if I walk 100 steps, how many steps will it take me to walk back? Yes, 100. Yes, you guys can feel free to shout at me because I can't actually see your chat right um, But yeah, so somehow what we're doing is uh, when we're counting, we're counting up uh, these steps and then we can count. That tells us how far away we are. And so that's one of the things MAP was used for is like we were using it for counting things up and measuring things like distance. Um, not, not the only thing. We also use it to count up the numbers of, say, um, random uh, mango uh, gummies that I have in here. So you can use it to count all kinds of things. Um, and somehow, when you count up, well, if I keep on walking, how far can I walk? If you're talking about abstract math, well, I mean, well, ignore the fact that there's a wall. But if I could somehow, like, flip through the wall and just keep on walking forever, well, maybe you'd argue, well, I can keep on walking as far away as I want. And so somehow that's what normal counting is about. That's saying you go one, two, three, four, and then you keep on going on a five, six, seven, eight, a million, two million, ten trillion, and so on. So your numbers keep on getting bigger over and over again as you are walk further and further away. But now, is that always the case? So then now what we're doing is I have invented a counting system that assumes that I can keep on walking further away. And that's true of well, is that true of me standing here today? So some people think that's true. Now, let's suppose that I have, um, let's see, oh, this might be a little small. So let's have using my Lego map. I'm gonna use this two feet factor. Now, the earth is round, right? So the earth is round. If I'm sitting here, that uh, my QQ penguin is sitting here on top of the earth and I have the QQ penguin walk around how many steps can a QQ take and uh, can, can a QQ kind of take? Let's say I start right here. Well, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 10, 11, 12, 13. Wait a moment. How many steps away is my QQ penguin from where uh, he started? Well, wait, isn't this where I started? So, who's right? Or am I, it's like, you think I'm 13 steps away or zero steps away from here where we started? It moved, it moved 13 steps, but like the net is zero. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, that's one uh, argument. Uh, did you have one back there? Sorry, what? Oh, both, both, zero and 13. So suddenly, like, distances aren't like entirely unique, right? But yeah, so you might be wondering, well, well, why is this so applicable? Well, I mean, it is also true that even if I could clip through walls, if I kept on walking all the way over there, and I kept on walking, I don't actually know how many steps, but uh, wait, so about, let's say two steps to a meter. A million meters. So if I walked about 4 million steps that way, how far away would I be from where I'm starting? Yep. And? The earth is round. So if I could keep on walking uh, and I could walk across oceans and water and all that, which I can't do, but um, if I could, um, eventually I would walk back to this place, right? Because just like a cuckoo penguin, we're walking on a round planet. So somehow I said a moment ago that when we're counting numbers, well, well, well we're counting number of steps, right? But we're not actually counting the number of steps you can walk on planet earth, right? 
Because if you kept, kept on walking, you'd eventually end up back where you started. And maybe people didn't know that back in the day because it was, well, hard to figure out that the earth was round. It took uh, a little bit of time for people to figure that out. But eventually, well, then all of a sudden, it seems like counting with regular numbers isn't actually completely perfect for, for walking on the earth. And maybe there are other shapes for which that's true for. So for example, maybe if I have a torus, oh, sorry, if I have a donut shape, a ring like this, and, uh, and I have uh, some weird feature, let's say this little skeleton Lego man walking along this, then you have the same thing that happens, right? As they walk around, eventually they get back to where they started. And that's actually true if, even if it walks around this other direction, the little distance is different. Okay, so the basic point I'm trying to make here is, well, if you were going to invent counting and you were a Kiku penguin on a very small sphere that was trying to count the number of steps, how would you invent it? I'll give you a moment to mow over that and let me check, the, check my notes. Yeah, so how would you invent these things from scratch? You don't have any idea about math, but maybe you do stuff to have some idea of counting. One, two, three. Well, how high would you end up counting if you were the little QQ penguin on this globe and the only thing you were counting was steps? Maybe you'd only invent numbers up to 13, right? Maybe not. Maybe you, you're like QQ penguins also counting other things like feathers and there are more than 13 feathers. But if you're only ever counting steps and you wanted to create a number system just for counting steps, well, there isn't ever a need to go above 13 on here. And so that's sort of the point I'm making here, which is that somehow when you're deal dealing with inventing numbers, what the sort of space you live in and what assumptions you make about how big numbers can get makes a huge difference. So like we've all, because of so many years of, of schooling, been trained to think about numbers as getting bigger over and over again, right? But if you're walking along a sphere, as you keep on walking, you actually get closer and closer to uh, wherever you started after a certain point, right? So if I keep on walking in one direction, I have no idea which direction China is from here because I have no idea which direction uh, anywhere is, but it actually doesn't matter so much, right? Because if I walk in any direction, I'm likely to get somewhere close to the other side of the world and eventually come back. And so somehow the geometry of the world makes a huge difference for these sorts of things. Uh, and let's see. Okay, so let me go back to my slides for a moment. Uh, come on, my, my screen share not working. Uh, start the broadcast. Let me get my camera back. Okay, so we had this example of uh, walking and uh, steps and a, a, or of a Lego man and uh, on the globe, or sorry, not the Lego man on the globe, the QQ penguin on the globe, or of the Lego man on the donut shaped, -shaped torus. And those things are all ex um, examples where sometimes when you take enough, oh, link slide in case any of the right stuff. Sometimes when you take enough steps forward, you end up back where you started. And and uh, we uh, often will call this clock arithmetic uh, for the simple reason that if you look at the clock up there, as the second hand goes round, it eventually ends up back where it started, right? And so um, after 60 minutes, you end up back at zero and so on and so on. But notice that real world examples, you don't always end up exactly where you started um, in the case of like a clock, because you might be like, well, maybe the second hand ends up back where it started, but somehow time is going forward. And so it's not always the case that you end up exactly where you started but you can still model part of it by saying, well, part of it is the sort of periodic behavior that it goes around the clock and it just start, goes back and repeats itself. Can you all think of other examples where this happens? <coughs> Sorry. But yeah, so other examples where things might repeat themselves after you do some number of steps or you move forward some number of uh, points. The running track, okay, great, yes. So if you're on the running track, you're running around, well, after 400 meters or, uh, well, 200 meters, depending on how big your track is, and all of a sudden you're back at your starting point. 
a round trip flight. Uh, okay, that's also kind of true. Like, it doesn't quite work as well because I'm not sure what the step is on a round trip flight. Okay, so we're all thinking in terms of physical things. Um, let me give you a hint. Uh, so I'm wearing a t-shirt today. Does anyone know what uh, my t-shirt says? So uh, for the record, this says 440 hertz. Some of you may have heard that before. Or maybe not. <laughs> That's also quite possible. Ah, going anywhere in a circular manner. Yes, that's true. Wavelengths, hamster wheel things. So if you're running around in a circle, that is absolutely true. Uh, a, mar um, a marathon, so let's, marathon is actually not true because in a marathon, you don't end up where you started for the most part. You're running your 26.2 uh, miles and you end up somewhere very different. In fact, I mean, if for any history buffs here, well, obviously the whole point of marathon was to go from one place to another and bring news of an impending invasion. Would watching a recorded video count? Because once you finish it, the only place to go is back to the beginning. Yeah, that's a good point. So if you have something on loop, then somehow that, that, is, that has the same kind of behavior. Um, the turning round thing that some doors have. Yes. Uh, oh, someone's getting tuning fork, um, which is not quite, ah, okay, great. Circle of fifths of music or just music in general. Um, so that's actually why I brought this here with me today. Uh, oh, I actually can't play it. So I'm not sure why I brought it. I was not thinking yesterday. Uh, but so if you're going to, uh, if you think about your scales, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, you end up back at do, even though it's a different octave. Um, sorry, that was a terrible scene. But even though it's a different octave, you end up roughly speaking where you started. And so you might ask, how do you formalize this idea that if you walk enough steps forward, you end up back where you started? And that is exactly what these clock numbers are good for. These clock arithmetic numbers are good because what you can do is you can formalize this idea that as you take steps forward, somehow things repeat in a loop. And this is very different from ordinary numbers that we talk about because normally numbers just get bigger and bigger the more steps you take. But that is not true for all kinds of phenomena. And it's not even true for walking steps along like along a um, non-flat surface. So if you were to uh, do, take steps along the sphere, which we are doing every day as we're walking along because the earth is roughly spherical, um, what's happening is that you're not actually um, getting further away the entire time, eventually you start getting closer again. And that is a super long-winded way of saying that this is the motivation and about, <laughs> this is the motivation about uh, the, the slot arithmetic numbers, which we're going to go into in a lot of gory mathematical detail. So I've sort of just thrown these things in here, and maybe like, that's a different way of counting. But if you have a different way of counting, what happens to addition? If you have a different way of, uh, it does the addition, addition still make sense? What is addition? So uh, if you, if it is currently 10 a.m., um, and I ask you, what happens in 26 hours? What time is it? What time is it in 26 hours from 10 a.m.? <clears throat> yeah, it's 12 p.m. Somehow you're adding 26 hours, but you're ending up back at 12 p.m. Uh, you're ending up back at noon. Uh, sorry, there was another chat message, but I think I missed, what was it? Addition changes. Yes, it's not linear, but it's on a circle. Um, and remember, we had a we had a number line that went from zero, one, two, three, to infinity in one direction, and minus two, to minus infinity in the other direction, right? But as I mentioned back all the way back in I think week one, what happens if you just twist this around into a circle? So you might end up with zero, one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, sorry. Right. So basically, what we've done is we've now twisted the entire number line into a circle. And it turns out when, when you do that, you still have this idea of counting. You can still walk steps along the circle, but then all of a sudden, addition changes. And if addition changes, then, well, so does multiplication, right? Because addition is repeated counting, multiplication is repeated addition. And so if you change, if you change addition, then you also change multiplication and you also change powers 
and he also changed fractions. Well, do fractions exist in this sort of, um, in this sort of a, oh, what happens to negative numbers? That's a really good question. Um, what does happen to negative numbers? Uh, actually, let, let, let's, um, since we have a little bit of time, let's uh, think about that. What happens to negative numbers as I walk along? So let me actually go back to my, um, uh, yeah, let me actually go, uh, we'll, we'll finish off with that actually. Oh uh, no, let's, uh, so let me just uh, mention a brief uh, other fun fact. We'll finish off with what happens to negative numbers and we'll talk a bit more about that on Wednesday. Um, but this could, brings us to an interesting physics question, which we're not going to explore because uh, actually exploring this idea involves ideas of curvature and differential geometry, which are much more advanced in this class. But remember, uh, so if we had a, uh, if we had the QQ penguin walking along on the table, then somehow it can keep on walking this direction and numbers keep on getting bigger. But if it's walking along a sphere with curvature, then somehow that messes it up. And so you can walk around and you end up back where you started. What about the universe? If I were to send a spaceship off flying away from Earth for, well, a gazillion years, would you end up being constantly getting further away? Or would you eventually end up back where you started? And well, the answer to that is, well, for now, scientists seem to think that the universe is mostly flat and that if you sent the spaceship off, it wouldn't end up back where it started, but that's not necessarily true. And maybe it's just real. And just like humanity once thought that the earth was flat, maybe we just think the universe is flat because we've never walked enough steps. Um, the universe is infinite, so it wouldn't have a shape. Well, is the universe infinite? Have you ever checked? Like, how far have you walked away from Earth? I know I've, like, well, I mean, I guess I've jumped up and down a couple of times, but that's like, what, maybe a couple feet? Um, but I guess a plane is the farthest away I've ever gone from Earth. So that's like, what, 10,000 feet up in the air? Ah, yeah, no. So, like, this is one of the standing questions in uh, modern physics. Right now, our best measurements seem to think that the universe is flat. But you could have said the same thing about the ancient Babylonians uh, thousands of years ago, their best measurements may have thought that the earth was flat. Yeah, okay, so uh, with that, let's, uh, I have a little bit of time, so let's talk a little bit about what happens with negative numbers. And uh, let me stop my screen share and uh, I will go back to uh, presenting. So, let's see, I have stopped my screen share, so hopefully, oh, okay, come on, okay. constantly having to adjust. Okay, so now let's go back to this. So let's say that it takes 13 steps for my QQ penguin to walk around the entire thing, right? And you might be like, well, do negative numbers still exist? Well, you might be like, well, if I walk two steps this way, then of course, walking two steps back is a negative two, right? But now the question you should ask yourself, though, is if I walk two steps this way, and then I walk another 11 steps, where do I end up? You end up back where you started, right? So if you walk two steps and you walk another 11 steps, you also end up back where you started. So somehow walking two steps forward and walking 11 steps versus walking two steps backwards are the same thing. So then you might ask, well, do you really need negative numbers? Honey? The whole point of getting negative numbers is so that you could like figure out how to get to anywhere you wanted to, right? Uh, because if you walk, uh, if I, I'm standing here and I walk forward, on. And I walk forward two steps. And if we assume that the Earth is infinitely flat, which it isn't, so I walk two steps. The only way for me to ever get back to where I started is to walk backwards two steps. But that's not true of the QQ penguin. The penguin is standing here, walks forward two steps. He can get back around without needing to walk backwards, which is walking another 11 steps. So um, the answer to that question, and we'll, we'll formalize this on Wednesday is that somehow, whenever you're walking uh, along a sphere or any sort of circle in block arithmetic, you don't really need negative numbers because you can always just walk more steps to get around. Um, another way of thinking about this is that, well, you know, someone mentioned earlier that uh, if you walk 13 steps, that's the same as walking zero steps. Well, maybe walking 11 steps is the same as walking minus two steps, right? Because if you walk 11 steps, 
then that's the same as if you had walked backwards two steps. And so somehow, when you're dealing with clock, clock arithmetic, you don't actually have to worry about creating a new set of numbers because all those numbers, because the numbers that allow you to walk backwards already exist. And uh, later on, we'll also get into similar questions of, well, if you have clock arithmetic, what happens when you try to do fractions? What happens when you try to do square roots? Do these numbers all already exist? Or do we need to uh, add new numbers the way we do with the real numbers in order to uh, get all these uh, fractions and uh, square roots and things like that? And that is going to be the central question we're going to be exploring on Wednesday and then after reading week. Um, and with that, I think that uh, I'm a little bit early, but let's go ahead and end lecture for now. I have office hours at 12. Um, and uh, oh, reminder, you guys have a quiz. I sent you guys an email late last night. Please make sure to go to your quiz because if you don't show up, well, I mean, it's hard to take your quiz if you're not there in here. Um, okay. Uh, I still have more candies. It is Valentine's Day. So if you want to steal some angel gummies, uh, please do. Uh, with that, thank you all very much. And I will see you on Wednesday.